Hi, I'm Christy Serling. I'm the Dean for the College of Education and Behavioral Sciences. I came to HBU in 2017, honestly, because we believe it was a direct call from the Lord to come. And I came as Associate Dean and served as Associate Dean until December 2020 when I became Interim Dean and then was later named Dean. My husband's a public school teacher and has taught for the last 23 years in public schools. He's taught everything from physics, chemistry, math, and right now building trades and construction. And so my family supports private schools, public schools, and so being the Dean for the College of Education and Behavioral Sciences at HBU is a really great fit for us. A couple of the initiatives I'm really excited about here at HBU within the College of Education and Behavioral Sciences. First of all, our SPARTAN Center for International Education. We recently celebrated our ribbon, ribbon cutting and, and celebrated the generous offer from Esther Wong uh, to be part of our college and university and the work that we're doing, supporting students getting international education and creating cultural exchange opportunities. We're really excited about our reading specialist degree and our partnership with Nyhouse Center, working on dyslexia training for our reading specialists, our undergrad students, and also serving in the community, working and tutoring in areas. And finally, one other thing that we're very exciting about, excited about is our Gideon Counseling Center. We're excited about the work that we're doing academically to train Christian counselors who will go out into the community and the world, counseling students and, and people who have needs, uh, mental health needs that are going on. Between the Counseling Center training component and also the services provided to our students, we have a lot of exciting things going on. Dr. Serling, what a, what a, first off, congratulations being appointed dean. Thank you. And yeah, I, it was so predictable to me that you would be the dean of the College of Education and Behavioral Sciences. I mean, you have had quite a career, and um, now you're in this strategic position. Um, t tell us what you're, you know, most excited about as you step into this role. I'm really excited about the opportunities that I have to be able to work with students one-on-one -on -one and really developing faculty as well as we each grow into our positions and we learn ways that we can serve our community through the skill sets that we have. Now there's a shortage of teachers, is there not, across Texas and... Uh, really I'm, across the nation, you know, right. Why is that? I mean, I, I have some ideas, but I'd love to know concrete reasons why there's such a shortage. I think that we can look at several reasons why we're looking at a shortage across the nation in education. I think, first of all, um, there have always been issues with low pay, um, looking at the workload. I think even, let's consider the pandemic. That was a quick shift for so many teachers and leaders to have to all of a sudden take all of the curriculum that we were doing, put it online, being able to sit down and talk about how do we meet students' needs, in an online fashion, but also in a hybrid fashion. Some students sitting in classrooms, but also teaching is a relationship. It's all about building relationship with students. And so hybrid models, computers, masks, that certainly created a huge learning curve for teachers. Teaching's a hard field. We care so much for the students in front of us um, when we consider some of the pay pieces and some of the other barriers that students are facing. I think that's caused some of the issues. <laughs> Now, with, with, I want to come back to that in a minute, but Esther Wong and this wonderful gift, and explain a little more detail what that initiative will entail. We are so excited about the Spartan Center for International Education. On two separate occasions, we've been able to take some of our HBU students to China to be able to serve in a cultural exchange where they worked and served in an English camp where our HBU students learned a little bit of Mandarin Chinese and we were able to teach a little bit of English and build relationship with incoming seventh or eighth grade students. What an opportunity to step outside of comfort zones, step outside of our Houston, Texas world and travel to the other side of the world and learn about another culture. We were able to see different sites in Shanghai and Beijing but really this opportunity for that cultural exchange. So with the Spartan Center for International Education, there's still a lot being developed on what we'll do with that, but continued opportunities for HBU students to go to other countries to be able to serve and to be able to learn, and also for opportunities for students from other countries to come here and to serve and to learn. We're showing pictures right now of some of those trips. I know Edward, Edward, Eddie Borges led a lot of those delegations, and these are pictures that 
of students in Chinese classrooms, uh, which is very remarkable in this nation that is so powerful and growing dramatically. The Spartan Initiative, does it include countries other than China? Yes, so there is a possibility that we will be also working with the Philippines. Esther Wong, her family, so starting with Julia Tan, and then the Spar family served together in the Philippines and created a school called Grace Christian, now it's college. So that school center goes from all the way early childhood all the way through college now. And so there's a chance that we'll be spending some time in the Philippines. Esther Wong's family still owns and operates that school. It is one of the largest schools in the Philippines. Um, it's an English-speaking school and um, it's grounded in faith. Oh, fantastic. In the whole education realm, our, our distinctive here is we've created alliances with a number of independent school districts throughout Metro Houston, and they've been tremendous relationships. Can you explain that? We are so fortunate to have very good partnerships with our local independent school districts. And some of that involves even private schools. We have some private charter schools and public charter schools, and then the traditional independent school district that we think about. And so we're very fortunate. What that looks like in some cases, right now, our undergraduate and graduate students are going to a school district, a school in Houston ISD, and they are training and tutoring students who didn't pass their STAR tests. And they're using training that we received from Nyhaus Center. And so what a great win, win, win. Nye House is being able to share some of their dyslexia training model that they have. They're training our students who are then going in the community and serving the community and getting some of their observation and field work hours that they need to get their certification. And that's benefiting those students who maybe didn't quite get the mark that they needed in order to move on to the next level. And so we talk about some of the learning gaps that perhaps occurred during the time of COVID pandemic and, and the, some of those different stressors. What a great opportunity for us to be there. But any day we're also doing field experiences out in EC through 12th grade classrooms. Uh, we have different opportunities where those teachers or leaders are coming here and speaking and offering opportunities for our students to learn. We have our association of student educators, which is our pre-service teachers part of an organization, and we have different guest speakers come in, principals, superintendents, HR directors, helping really guide them through their career. We know that a lot of teachers, I think the number is over 50%, leave teaching within the first five years. Do they really? It's really sad. It's a sad number. We need excellent teachers in all schools. And so our job is to really help provide that mentorship community that's going to guide them through their teaching career so that we're able to keep them beyond that five years. You also have helped teachers in the, in the graduate area. Can you talk about that? Yes, we have a robust graduate program in our education opportunities. We have reading specialists, we have ed educational diag diagnostician, uh, we have opportunities for professional school counseling, really principals program, and even superintendents through our doctoral program. And so we are training this next generation of teachers and leaders who are gonna make a difference in the community. And so when I think about some of our doctoral students, for example, I can off the top of my head think of one who's an assistant superintendent in one of our area school districts, another one who's an HR director in an area school district, another one who's serving as a leader in special education services in an area school district. And so we're infusing the community with faith-based, strong leaders and teachers. HBU has this Christian mooring to it, uh, and the reinforcement of spiritual values. Mm -hmm. With that, obvious, lots of character uh, derivatives from the Judeo-Christian ethic. That has to make a difference to have a teacher who is a Christian. They, they're, they're ethical, they, they have integrity, they don't lie. Um, how has, I know in our nursing program, it's, they've been so appreciative of the, the character quality of the products of HBU. How has it been received, the type of teachers we have sent to these different school districts around the state and beyond? HBU teachers are in high demand. I will tell you, I was meeting with a local district recently and they said, we will hire every single one of your candidates, bring them to us. Wow. And so um, I can think of at a recent career fair we had, one 
particular candidate, there was a bidding war going between two districts <laughs> trying to get him. HBU candidates are highly sought after because of their ethical and moral character, because of the way they work with students. Think about with, because of our Christian faith and beliefs, how we see somebody else. Students are not always sitting in their desks eager to learn. Part of teaching is creating that desire to learn, creating that vision for wanting to gain information and knowledge, creating a curiosity. And that takes a special teacher to be able to do that. Teaching is hard work. And so what I love about our students is they come in with that. I was speaking to a professor this morning and she was talking about the presentations students in her children's literature class were giving. And she said multiple times she got teary just thinking at how well developed they are in their skill set and their care for students and their innovation in their lessons and what a difference that's going to make in the classroom and in our communities. Is there any trends that have been established yet or you anticipate being established that'll be new to the curriculum or an addendum because of the pandemic or the post-pandemic or, or is it gonna be back hopefully business as usual and not any real take away that would permanently change the, the teaching aspect? So I do think there will be some changes that will stay, some for the good. Um, so in Indiana, we had what was called a snow day. That doesn't happen too often here yeah. in Texas, but students looked forward to a snow day, but that's kind of done now because there's the digital option, yeah. log on, we'll do e-school. And I see that a lot. There are the opportunities. If you're going to be absent, log in, see what we did and get caught up on those assignments right away. And in some ways, what a great opportunity mm -hmm. to shorten that gap um, that frequently happens. I think in some ways it's caused schools to be a lot more flexible. A student's not able to be there for an illness, and, but they're still able to get work done, but of course just protecting everybody that they're not there, being able to still deliver that instruction in different ways. I think it caused teachers and really higher ed faculty as well to be so much more innovative and creative about how we give our information. And so recording lectures or using different types of academic technology to make our lessons engaging, even if our students weren't sitting in front of us. I think about things like a flipped classroom setting, which is where you record your lectures and you have videos that students watch on their own at home. Mm -hmm. Then when they come in, they're applying that knowledge and they're practicing with that material that changes the way we do our information and the exchange of information. And so I think some of those pieces will stay. I live in Fulcher, Texas, which is the fastest growing city in the state of Texas on the west side. Our schools are just exploding. They, keep, they can't build them fast enough. Is public school education growing across Texas? I, I don't know the exact numbers that I could say it is growing. I think we're going to see growth in offshoots. We talk about this innovation that happened because of COVID. I think we'll see a lot more homeschool communities and co-ops and I think homeschool families who tried something out during COVID. They were given curriculum from the schools, mm -hmm. but they were supporting their students learning and they found they liked it and they found that they could do parts of mm -hmm. it. And I see maybe that growing as well. I also see opportunities for private schools to grow. So I think that all of our schools, we, they follow the trends of what we see in our um, population. But so I think, yes, our schools are growing, they're maxed out. Um, as far as hallways and classroom sizes in a lot of our heavily populated areas. Now, Thomas Van Zandt was just here, a homeschooling student, graduate, came to the Honors College. Th this young man was amazing. Just took my breath away. It was stunning. The homeschooling arena is exploding post-pandemic, as is the Christian school movement. Mm -hmm. Our Department of Education, as Dean of the College of Education, we have a unique posturing to those demographic or, or those modalities as well, right? Can you talk about that just a little bit? Sure, I think we have great opportunity to support families. I think certainly when you think about our Honors College or you think about the Academy, I think what a great opportunity. And tell us about the Academy, because we don't say enough about the Academy, so take a few minutes and explain what the Academy is. So the Academy is an opportunity for high school students to come to HBU to earn dual credit to be able to earn their high school credit and college credit as they're working towards completing their degrees. And so it's a great opportunity for high school students to come on campus 
um, to be able to be here to work with our professors and to be able to get that HBU feel, that HBU experience uh, that we know and value. And, and Dr. Henze, the dean over that program, um, would be able to give a lot of great information to families who are interested in their high school students who are maybe in a private school or in a homeschool opportunity to be able to come and, and get some credits and while experiencing excellent teaching from HBU faculty. You had a background as a teacher. I mean, I remember it was, a, no wonder you could be a dean of this. You were right in the <laughs> trenches. I mean, it's like the person who was selling retail that later ran the whole store. <laughs> I mean, how did that predispose you to where you are now and the decisions you make on a weekly basis? I think a couple of things. Certainly, one, I'm so grateful for my parents. I have military parents, and so my dad was in the Navy for 22 that. years. So we traveled all over the United States, and so I was able to experience a lot of different types of schools in a lot of different cities. And so I think that certainly formed who I am. In addition to that, my background as a teacher. I knew I wanted to be a teacher, and I was convinced I would be in an English and theater classroom for my entire career. And so that was my heart, to be in a classroom, to care for students, who maybe weren't going to make it, students who were not as successful or who didn't have someone advocating for them. My desire was to advocate. And so I thought I would be a teacher and that's what I was going to do until I had a principal who kept saying to me, get your principal's license, get your principal's license. I said, sounds like a thankless job to me. I think I'll stay in the classroom. And he encouraged me to advocate for students on a larger scale, those students who maybe weren't going to make it. And so I became an assistant principal and a principal and then a superintendent. And through that, one of the values that I held was that I wanted to still teach one class every year. Mm -hmm. And so I maintained that I was always in the classroom, at least one class with students. So I was taking attendance. I was managing behavior. I was writing lesson plans. All the way through being a superintendent, I did that. So then when I transitioned into higher education, I maintained always teaching a class. And in fact, I still do a lot of volunteer work in our local K-12 schools and spend time with students every day. So even if I'm not able to teach a class, um, directing a play at a local middle school and spending six weeks all with middle school students will certainly remind me what it is like teaching middle school students. So what that does for me is when I make decisions that impact faculty and that impact students, first of all, I have a student focus. And second of all, I'm teaching, and so I know what it feels like. Mm -hmm. I am reminded that I am a better teacher when I am a student. I'm a better leader when I'm a teacher. And so I try to keep that in mind, so then that helps me filter the decisions I'm making, that we have to keep a student focus, know where we're headed, and what are we doing to help our students be successful, and then they're multiplying and they're heading out advocating for students so that they are successful. Uh, no wonder you're the Dean of the College of Education and Behavioral Sciences at HVU. What a great background you have and what a great person you are. Take a few moments and, you know, there's some people that may be listening or representing, representing stu potential students that are thinking about HVU as opposed to another school. Why should they come here and what will they get in the College of Education and Behavioral Sciences? I have so much that I could share on that. Uh, first of all, our student body is so dynamic, so diverse, and I watch our student body invest in one another, get to know one another. I was meeting with a student this week and she is from another college but is also getting a degree in my area, and I just asked to meet with her. And I said, why does HBU make a difference? Why did you choose HBU? You came from a little bit of a distance, why? And she said, I don't know if I knew at first, but I can tell you now that I've been here almost a semester. And I said, tell me, what are you experiencing? She said, I lacked some confidence. And my professor saw that, encouraged me, challenged me, gave me the tools to be successful. And she said, I'm more confident than I've ever been in standing in front of a class, standing in front of a group of my peers and speaking. And she said, I'm, I've grown so much in this short amount of time already the way that I've grown. She said, the fact that I'm sitting here talking to you shows some of that. She talked about the faith piece. And I think that's one of the key things I see throughout all of our faculty. You see a student struggling, we're able to talk to them, but also pray for them and with them. I think about some of the pieces, sometimes in education programs specifically, if I talk about that for a minute, 
A student who's going to get a certification may not get into a classroom to try out some things until their junior year. Well, by that point, if it doesn't work out or it's not the right grade level, it's a little bit late to make a shift. Our students, first semester, are going out into the field looking at different classrooms and participating in classrooms. What a difference when you do that your first semester and every semester throughout your entire career, rather than waiting until second semester junior year, right before you're getting into your clinical teaching. We far exceed TEA expectations wow. for field experience. And so what a placement opportunity. I think it mentioned already that, that space where we are uniquely situated within the community. What an opportunity. Houston ISD is the second or third highest employment opportunity in Houston. Such great job market for our students who are graduating. If I think about on the counseling side, for example, if someone would want to come here to consider counseling, we have a counseling center right here on campus where our candidates will go into the counseling center and they will do their practicum and their internship here on campus. And they would be able to have that clinically informed and spiritually infused opportunity to grow in their faith while they're counseling candidates. Uh, I think about our psychology program. We're doing something right now called Get Psyched. And <laughs> Get Psyched is all about recruitment and retention and looking at ways that we can connect in our community. We don't want someone graduating with a degree in psychology and thinking they don't know what their next step is. And so we've created these Get Psyched events so that we are tracking students from freshman year through graduation into graduate school or into a career and helping them walk their way through. What an opportunity that they're not just floundering, figuring out what they're going to do with their degree. That is amazing. Dr. Christy Serling, the Dean of the College of Education and Behavioral Sciences, articulated so well why there is a difference in getting a degree at HBU. And I want you to check it out at hbu.edu slash admissions, 281-649-3211. Our graduate school, hbu.edu slash grad, G-R-A-D, 281-649-3269. And we celebrate students in 42 states, almost all 50 states, representative of HBU students. And so you can come to HBU online, hbuonline.com, 855-428-1960. You know, uh, there is a real difference, and I hear it all the time in all of these podcasts, that, and it's this thing, people care about me at HBU. My, I'm my faculty member, my teacher is accessible. I'm not a number. I, I have heard that so many times. And people don't care how much you know till they know how much you care, right? That's right. And uh, we know you care and what a gift you are. And so we're going to stay in touch with you. And we want you to come back and keep us up to date on all the developments. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thanks for being here.